Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning, June 20th. We're going to be talking about New Church Day in the spiritual world this morning. Uh, and we'll begin with singing the song in the liturgy, The Sun Shines in Splendor, page 1074. The Lord God, Jesus Christ, doth reign, whose kingdom shall be for ages and ages. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. With my whole heart I have sought you. O oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may see wondrous things from your law. O Lord, we do pray that you open our eyes to see the wondrous things, things which you have written in your word and you have given to us, in a word that comes to us in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the teachings, the word of the Third Testament, the writings of the new church. Lord, you have given your law and you end this great work of the Third Testament, the writings, with the word saying that you, Jesus Christ, do reign and your kingdom shall be for ages and ages. You end by telling us, reminding us, and imploring us to follow you as the one only God of heaven and earth. O oh Lord, as we celebrate this day when you sent out your 12 disciples, we think about what that means to us in terms of being the recipient of that message, and also what role we can play in also sharing that message with others. Lord, help open our eyes that we may see how best to serve you and our neighbor. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. O Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. Our recitation this morning is taken from the True Christian Religion, number 791. After this work was finished, 
the Lord called together His twelve disciples who followed Him in the world, and the next day He sent them all forth throughout the whole spiritual world to preach the Gospel that the Lord God Jesus Christ reigns, whose kingdom shall be for ages and ages. This took place on the 19th day of June, 1770. Our first lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. The Lord is speaking to His disciples, telling them about things that are going to come to pass. In another Gospel, the Lord has said to them, there are so many things I cannot tell you. But there were so many things He did tell them about what some would call the end times. We're going to read a little section here, number 14, verse 14, and then some other verses after that. The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the world as a witness to all the nations until the end shall come. And then a little later on in that same chapter, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened The moon will not give forth its light. The stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then the the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven and all the tribes of the earth and all of the tribes uh, they shall mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet And they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of the earth to another. How good are you with numbers? Can you count up to ten by looking at your hands? Uh, That's kind of how we often start, isn't it? Teaching people to count. You start learning how to count when... Somebody asks you when you're really little, how old are you? And little kids will go, and they might not even know what that really means, but everybody's been doing that to them for so long. Yay, it's your first birthday. You're this old. And then you're this old. And then you're this old. There are lots of numbers and a lot of counting that takes place in the Word. And today, June 20th, is the day after, can you do that math? What was yesterday? If today is the 20th, if yesterday was June 19th. And it's a very special day in the new church. And that's why we have these beautiful flags out. New church flags that are made up of colors. How many colors do you see? Can you count them? One, two, red and white. Red standing for love that the Lord gives us. And white standing for the truth. So on this day... The day we're celebrating, June 19th, that's not today, but yesterday, on the day we're celebrating, June 19th, something important, really important happened. The Lord sent out His disciples. Now again, how, you, how good are you with numbers? Do you remember how many disciples there were? Here's a picture of the Lord, and can you count them? There are 12 disciples there. And you might know that from hearing the stories of the Word. On June 19th, a number of years ago, do you remember what number was mentioned in the recitation? This took place on June 19th, 1770. That's a long time ago. Okay, here's another math question. How long was 1770? Is that 10 years ago? Is that 100 years ago? Is that a million years ago? 1770 was, see if you get it right, 251 years ago. That's a long time, isn't it? You think to the Lord that was a long time? When the Lord was meeting with His 12 disciples the first time, that was 2,000, more than 2,000 years ago. And then in our story today, 
June 19th, the Lord's meeting again with his disciples 250 years ago. Again, we can do math. I'm not going to get into that. Because we don't know exactly when the Lord met the first time with his disciples. But we do know this time that we're looking at today. He met 251 years ago with his disciples. And Emmanuel Swedenborg got to hear about that and see about that. And so he wrote about it. In our recitation, it mentions when this work was finished. This is a copy of what's being spoken about. In our recitation, this work is, how good are you with Latin? Not only am I asking you numbers, now I'm asking you about a foreign language. Vera Christiana Religio. Vera means true. Christianity, I bet you can... You can figure out what that means, right? Christian and religio. That sounds pretty much like religion, right? Yes, this book was called True Christian Religion. And this is the copy of what the first edition would have looked like when Emanuel Swedenborg finished this book and published it. Very beautiful writing. You oftentimes see at the beginning of a chapter a fancy letter. And now I have three markers in this book. This is written in Latin, which is the language Swedenborg published the word of the new church in. And right after the first introductory four passages, Emanuel Swedenborg says, I have an important note I want to tell you. Right at the beginning of starting to talk about God the Creator, the beginning of the true Christian religion it talks about a lot of subjects, a lot of ideas that we especially will know about because the Lord's made his second coming by means of this work and other works of Emanuel Swedenborg. So right at the beginning, he says, I want to tell you about this important thing that happened. When this book was finished, the Lord sent out his 12 disciples. If you look behind me, you see a copy of the Word. And you might be able to notice that it also, but not in Latin, in English, says the true Christian religion. We have those first four numbers up on the altar of the word, not a whole edition of the true Christian religion, because this is the word that is the second coming. These books that Swedenborg was led by the Lord to write, these books are the second coming of the Lord. So when this work was finished, it says the Lord called together his disciples and told them to go out and preach. And that same statement is made again later on in number 108 in the true Christian religion. And then later on, at the very end, the last section of the book, very bottom, it says, here's a, here's a memorial, here's a memorable thing that happened. And I doubt you can read it from here. But this little section all by itself is telling us about the Lord sending out his disciples. How long ago was that? 251 years ago. And we celebrate it today, a day after it took place 251 years ago. Because it is one of the most important days in the church year. We love Christmas and Easter. The Lord was born as a baby. The Lord was glorified and rose from the tomb. And New Church Day reminds us that the Lord fulfilled the things He said would happen after He was on earth and died and was glorified. He said, I will return to you. I will not leave you like orphans. And June 19th is a celebration of that return. The twelve disciples who followed him on in the earth went out throughout the spiritual world. And what did they preach? They preached the things that we have on our altar. Especially that last book, True Christian Religion. The idea is that there's one God. There aren't three, there aren't a dozen. There's one God. So, perhaps the most important number for you to remember is one. The one God, the Lord Jesus Christ whose kingdom shall be for ages and ages. He is celebrated on June 19th. Amen.
Let us pray. O Lord, help us to see how important it is that You have given us the truth of Your second coming. The Word that You have given to us. The Word that teaches us about You and how important You are in our lives. And how we must follow You and do what You ask of us. Lord, help us to celebrate in our hearts knowing this truth of Your Word and being able to share it with others. Not to be preachy or self-righteous, but simply to know with assurance that You are our God. You are a God of mercy and love. You are the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in one. In You dwells the fullness of everything divine. Let us always cherish that truth, the great pearl of price, of of great price, that we may come into Your kingdom, know the things of Your kingdom, and spread the good things that are of Your kingdom. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come. Amen. Now we'll join together in singing this song, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, number 859.
taken from the work True Christian Religion, number 108, the middle number in which the statement about the events of June 19th are spoken of. The date itself isn't given except in number 791, which was our recitation. And the second number comes from that final section where Swedenborg explains in the earliest mention that this is going to be further explained when the consummation of the age, the second coming, and the spiritual world are described. To show that the divine trinity is united to the Lord is the chief object of this work. Now that line doesn't appear in the reading that got sent out. To this I'll add the following new information. Some months ago, the twelve apostles were called together by the Lord and they were sent forth through the whole spiritual world as they formerly were sent through the whole natural world with the command to preach the gospel. And to each apostle was assigned a particular province. And this command they were executing with great zeal and industry. But on these subjects, more will be said in the last chapter of this book where the consummation of the age, the Lord's coming, and the new church are specifically treated of. And then in that last section, among other things being spoken of concerning, concerning the new church, there is then a section following that talks about various people, various church leaders. just talks about the spiritual world. And that is how the work Christian religion ends. It talks about people from England, Sweden, Holland, Germany, Italy, France. So in number 794, we find these words. From, from what I have seen during so many years, I can relate the following. In the spiritual world, there are lands just there are, as there are in the natural world. There are plains and valleys, mountains and hills, springs and rivers. There are parks gardens, groves, and forests. There are cities, and there are palaces and houses in them. There are writings and books. There are occupations and businesses. There's gold and silver and precious stones. In a word, there are each and all things there that there are in the natural world. Although the things in heaven are immeasurably more perfect. But there is this difference. That all the things seen in the spiritual world are instantaneously created by the Lord as the houses and the parks, the food and the rest. And they are created in correspondence with the interiors of the angels and the spirits, which are their affections and thoughts. Well, all things seen in the natural world spring up and grow from seed. Here end our lessons from the word, blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. We'll sing the song, Come Unto Me, All Ye That Labor, number 1108.
the section in True Christian Religion, which we first read, number 108. It is the end part of a treatment concerning the, the Lord, God the Creator, the Lord the Redeemer. In the next section, he'll be speaking of the Holy Spirit, then the Trinity, then the Holy Supper, baptism, good works, faith, charity. There are a number of universal theological truths that each chapter in the true Christian religion present. Does it cover everything in the new church? All the important doctrines? Well, you'd say, sure. There's a whole book, you know, dedicated to conjugal love, and it's not that it's never mentioned in the true church true Christian religion, but it doesn't get its whole chapter. The last lesson we read, you might think, well, it sounds so familiar. We hear about that, especially we like to read passages like that when somebody has passed from this world into the next to reassure us, give us a sense of of where they're going and what they're going to do. Is it going to be different? And numbers like this, passages like this, expressly state, you know, it's very, very similar. We're going to leave this world and we're going to go to that world. The biggest difference, it says, in that number, 794, is that in this world, things are just the way they are because they're correspondential and fixed. In that world, things appear instantaneously according to your thoughts and your affections. So you can get a view of all the flags, the new church flags, Beautiful flags, red and white. Red corresponding to love or affection or desires, interests, delights. Things that connect with the will part of us. Our heart, we might say. And then the white. Corresponding to things of wisdom, truth, understanding, knowledge. Have you noticed which one's above and which is below? Some people say, I wonder how I can get a New Church Day flag. Well, there are several countries that have this flag, some just like that and some reversed. We keep the red on top because it is the primary aspect. It is what really instantaneously changes what we see and how we experience the spiritual world. And you know, it's what instantaneously and changes how we see the Word and therefore how we see the teachings of the second coming, and therefore how we adhere to all that is involved with that statement that the Lord God Jesus Christ reigns, whose kingdom shall be for ages and ages. So the focus I want to bring our minds back to is the one, the one line that comes before this introductory statement about the sending forth of the twelve disciples. This line says, to show that the divine trinity is united in the Lord. That's the chief object of this work. This work. Is it just this work, TCR? This work And where the three statements are made concerning this work and the twelve disciples, this work, of course, is representative of all the work that goes into the Word. This work. The work of uniting good and truth in our hearts. The work of seeing the second coming in what's been revealed through the writings of the new church. The work of comprehending the basic truths of the universal ideas of the new church. All of that is summarized in this one statement concerning the main object of this work is to see that the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is united in the divine human of the Lord God Jesus Christ. This, 
to show this is the chief object of this work. So in one sense, it doesn't surprise us if the June 19th event is mentioned right at the very beginning, the introduction of the universal truths of faith, which we bind with our copy of the Old and New Testament on the, on the, word, on the altar. Those four passages that are basically introducing us to this work, the work of TCR, but this work, the work of receiving in our hearts that which is available in the spiritual world. So we, we hear right then, right after that introduction, that in the section on God the Creator, Swedenborg mentions, I'm going to mention these, these 12 disciples went out with great zeal to preach what's in the rest of this work, the rest of the teachings of His second coming. Because they went forth to present the gospel of the second coming. Many things they couldn't hear while they were on earth. They couldn't quite comprehend how that man who was living and eating, sleeping, moving around with them, how that man was God Himself. They got glimpses of it. And so do we. So at the very beginning, the introduction, this work is mentioned. This work of the spreading of the Gospel of the new church. And then after the section on the God, God the, the, the Creator, talking about the Lord, the Redeemer, we're going to get into some heavy theology. Now, how well did you do during the children's talk with getting the numbers straight? Are you good with math? Some people, no problem. 1770, 2021, 250 years ago. Other people go, hmm. <laughs> 251 years ago. I got a mathematician helping me out up there. The teachings of the church can become so complex in our thinking. Did you memorize when I told you all those things out of that passage in true Christian religion? All the things that are mentioned that are in the spiritual world? Can you think of a couple things that aren't mentioned? It doesn't mention clothing. It mentions houses and food. It doesn't mention animals. It mentions rivers and mountains. You think, was that arbitrary? We're not going to focus exactly on those details. Just to say that what we read about in the other world and what we have, what we'll experience and what Swedenborg has shared with us in one passage is sort of out there that everything there depends upon our heart, our affections, our loves. We're going to see wonderful places. And when the Lord sent out His disciples throughout all the spiritual world, they went to mountains and plains and cities and rural areas. They went far and they went near. That's the work. And our work is to take that in. Not complicate it. Take that in and try to comprehend it. I love our new church flags. They're really simple. Red and white. Really simple. I love the basis, the basic ideas of our doctrine. Pretty simple. As I ended with the children's talk by saying, one, just think about one. We have one God. One God. And there's lots of ways to explain the Trinity. TCR spends three chapters, four chapters, talking about God the Creator, the Lord the Redeemer, the Holy Spirit, and then the Trinity, bringing it all together. The most important thing is to focus on the primary teachings of the Lord, which puts red on top primary teachings of the Lord are to go out with wisdom and love. Up to the point of the last judgment spoken of as having taken place in 1757, up to that point, people were enslaved by an idea that true Christian religion involved believing what God has done for us. What God has done for us by sending His Son, 
looking with mercy upon His Son and having the blood of His Son cover all the sins of all the other people. That was an idea that was presented and you couldn't get far in Protestant Christianity without trying to figure that out and being able to say you believe that. And it's still current today. And that idea we talk about a lot during these times because it's the dragon. That idea that white's on top. White's more important. It says the palm of the church or the, the, the trophy of the church is given to faith. It's not. Do you know how hard it is to fight against the current, the prevailing thought of most people in a country or in the Christian world and come out with a book called The True Christian Religion and say, by the way, it's love. It's charity. It's acknowledging the divine coming into my heart and it's the Lord's in me, not my own. And all these teachings are to guide me to be a loving person. To have compassion. To treat people around me as it says, a father would treat a child. Today being Father's Day, we think about what is it about our fathers that we really love? Was it when they were stern and telling us that we were so wrong about this and that and the other thing? Or was it when they came to us with love and tried to teach us? When they came to us with love and supported us. When they came to us with love and said, I'll help you. Oh, it's great to have a father going to support me when I'm growing up, go through college, etc., etc. Is the most important thing about your dad really his money? And fathers, when you think about what it all meant, you're facing your grave and you think, What's going to be on my tombstone? He worked really hard and he was barely ever seen by his children. He worked really hard. He made a lot of money and uh, uh, I wish I knew him better. <laughs> What's going to be on our gravestone? I mean, maybe you won't have anything. But when we go through life and we think about what, what, what's it worth? Why is Father Day even an important subject? It's because we want to emulate what the Lord teaches us. Simply put in the flag here. My father was a loving man. He tried his best to provide for the things that would help me on my journey. And that's the model that true fatherhood follows. It's the model of the Lord as a father. Because we know, don't we dads, that we make so many mistakes. We hurt our children in so many different ways. There's no such thing as a perfect father except the Lord. The Lord gives us the ability to see into the spiritual world with our natural minds by reading the teachings that are in the literal sense of the threefold word. Swedenborg's eyes were opened and he began to be able to understand the internal sense of the word because he saw the way heaven operated. He saw the way correspondences worked. He saw that the Lord's divine love meant that angels were happy loving one another and their environment was then beautiful with the trees and with the parks and with the houses and with the gardens, with the rainbows. And that while we're here on earth, that is the heaven that we need to absorb through the correspondence of the love and wisdom the Lord gives us. The object of the work, the work that when completed meant the Lord sent out His twelve disciples, the object is for us to unify our concept of God the Creator, God the Redeemer, God the Holy Spirit. Within each one of us, we have the same Trinity. That soul that we receive that is the life of our minds and bodies. The thoughts that we have, that we project through the things that we say and the things that we do. And then the ability to have a presence in the world. And have an effect, a heritage. They need to be one. We need to not have a secret life about what we truly believe, but then what we talk about to others. 
And we're just as prone to fall under the ideas related to the dragon that we have all these teachings. And so we're, we're doing pretty well, right? Well, that'd be taking the flag and turning it upside down. The second feature, as we know in the book of Revelation, is what's called the city of Babylon. And that's falsifying the red and obliterating the white. It comes from a love of dominion that is not the most important love in our lives, but so often can take over. That love of wanting to control what other people do. Preachers, the church itself, have to focus on not entering into the love of dominion. It's not my job as a preacher to tell you how you have to think and what you must do to go to heaven. My job is to present the Word to you and for you to then follow the Word. The love of dominion would say, well, if you don't follow it the way I want you to follow it, I'm going to make it less comfortable for you to be in our church. I'm going to make it actually impossible. If you don't do exactly what I say, then you can't come to church. I don't want you in church. If you have inclinations and desires and thoughts and tendencies that I don't like, I don't want you to come to church. What great power the authorities in the church have. That's what's spoken of as the great whore of Babylon. That desire to get what I want for my sake. And you better serve me. It is why there had to be a, a last judgment spoken of in 1757. And why it is that we have the word written in a universal language, Latin. It can be translated into any language across the world. And why you, I rarely point at my congregation, but I will, you, you have to pick up the Word and find out, is your life in order? Is red on top? Is love most important? Is the truth guiding you? Is what the preacher is preaching really the truth of the Word? You want to trust your leaders. You want to trust your fathers and your mothers. You want to trust the church. You want to trust your government. And you're never to blindly follow. The chief object of this work which was completed and the Lord sent out His twelve disciples, the chief object was to bring a unity of the ideas of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to bring them together and show that the one God of heaven and earth is the Lord. To bring a unity, your desire to follow the Lord, the preachings of the church, the leading of the church, you have to make the decision about how they come together. And you can't blame it on somebody else if you're not following the Lord. Every one of us is given the freedom now. The freedom that is spoken of so often in the new church. Every one of us is given the freedom to decide for ourselves what we believe is true. And that is one of the scariest things for pastors, right? We want you all to believe what we believe. And parents, right, with their children, we want you to do the things that we know are so good. Any teacher with a student, we want you to get it. The freedom, spiritual freedom, that is so, so much at the heart of new church teaching is that you have to decide for yourself what the Lord is saying to you in His Word. You have to decide what you believe is the Word. And we objectify what we believe at all of it, and in the general church in Canada and in the general church international of what we believe is the Word by putting true Christian religion at the end of many copies that we put on our altars. And you don't have to believe that. But this group of people believes that. Freely choose which group of people you want to belong to to help you on your journey to follow the Lord. Father's Day is a great time to reflect upon the Lord leading, meeting again with His twelve disciples thousands of years after He first met them and saying, i got another job for you. As the loving God of heaven, as the one God of heaven and earth, as now providing with the, the teachings that have now 
settle things in the spiritual world, the last judgment having taken place 13 years before that, having settled that, now go back, go back out into the world as you did when you were my disciples on earth. Preach the gospel that the Lord God Jesus Christ reigns. Teach the teachings that are presented as a universal theology of a true Christian religion. This is the Lord's second coming. We celebrate it because it's powerful to know the Lord as our Heavenly Father gives us these teachings and we can come and be part of the Lord as the church, our Heavenly Mother. The Lord within us, opening our arms inviting to us all people who would like to follow on the path that we can help provide or another path, whichever way you want to follow the Lord. It's really important. There are 12 gates to the holy city. No pastor in the new church, it's in my opinion, understanding the teachings of the word is say you have to go through that gate. You find your pathway. Here are the teachings. Here is a presentation of the truth. Let the Lord's love that He's placed within you guide you through your delights, through the enlightenment He gives you to find Him. And then this second part of the lesson will come. The Lord will give us instantaneously these beautiful blessings of the spiritual world even now in our hearts while we're in the natural world because we follow our delights given to us by the Lord and we follow the truth, the path that leads us to His kingdom. Amen. To the one only God, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and dominion forever and ever. We'll join together in singing the song, Father, to us thy children, 854. prayer. Lord, our Heavenly Father, we come to you. We ask that you give us the blessings of your kingdom, not because we deserve it, but because we wish to dwell with you in more fullness with all of our lives, with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, to follow you and your commandments, to be among those who in heart receive the teachings of your disciples whom you sent out 251 years ago in natural time, but send out today into our hearts in spiritual time. 
May we be in that state of reception, O Lord, where we hear your guidance, your teaching, where we hear and feel your love, your blessings. Let us be in that spiritual state, O Lord, where we can see all the beauties of heaven and how they're reflected in the natural beauty we enjoy here on earth. Lord, today, the last day of spring and the first day of summer, we know that it's not a mistake that June 19th lands at this time of year where the beginning of the blessings of the season are fully upon us, but will continue to grow and increase as the trees from flowers produce fruits. So we ourselves, Lord, ask that we can continue on that journey, staying in the springtime of life that you have led us to, to find you and to serve you. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We close our service by singing the final hymn, Praise the Lord, the King of Heaven, number 837.